I think somebody wants the floor there, right? Yeah, I would like to, to ask a question. My name is Razvan Nicolescu, I'm from Romania, and I work for uh, Deloitte Central Europe. In 2014, I served my country as, as its Minister of Energy. Um, well, so I think we can all agree that uh, in order to deal with climate change, we need to have this energy transition. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing you all, and all of you are saying we need R&D, we need to, to decrease cost. My question to you is how can we manage actually to avoid a duplication of R&D programs between mm -hmm. public sector, okay. private sector, between China and US, between Europe and I don't know some other countries, is mm -hmm. it possible, I, I mean, to create a kind of platform under the United Nations mm -hmm. or under another body and to exchange information? Because at the end of the day, this is probably one of the biggest threats faced by our, uh, uh, by our humanity. I mean, we need to cooperate, we need to be more efficient. How can we deal with that? Yeah. Well, as Ladislav said, you know, it's, it's more or less the market is prevailing. You know, the solar panel is so cheap now. So that is definitely anywhere in the world. The building, the solar uh, is, is, a, is maybe in the near future. Do not need to give any kind of public support feed-in tariffs. Japan is suffering with a very high feed-in tariff because the cost of generation is getting too high. So maybe more kind of, uh, let's say, uh, auction in the market make better sense with the progress technology. So, in fact, the, the, the market is answering itself. But, Ladislav, yes? I, I may add up to, uh, to uh, your, your answer with one uh, specific comment, which is not public-private, but which is among the private sector. And you may know that uh, we have created uh, an organization called the OGCI, Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, where we're going to dedicate uh, about uh, $1 billion. Uh, and that's 10 companies which have joined this initiative. And you know, generally we are competitors. And in this particular case, those companies got together. I can tell you, this is uh, Total, BP, Shell, Statoil from Norway, Repsol from Spain, ENI from Italy, Pemex from Mexico, CNPC from China, Reliance from India, and Saudi Aramco from Saudi Arabia. So you can imagine these 10 companies together deciding that we would not compete one against the other, but we would put our research, our money together in order to make some investments with regard to climate change. So I think that's a good example, as you rightly mentioned, to say, rather than competing, let's get together because we all have interest in working together. Thank you, very good point. Yes, Andre. Yeah. Another yes. comment yes. and a last comment point. on hydro. I, I, I realize that there's been opposition to large hydro plants mainly, but that opposition came mainly because of flooding. There are many large hydro projects uh, that have, are of the type of run-of-the-river type. Inga project in Africa doesn't require only minimal uh, flooding. And again, potential is half of the actual available power in Africa. So it's huge, and putting that aside will not, uh, certainly not help the, uh, what we're trying to do to control climate. And this is only one example. Uh, I'd like to add to your comments, it's true that it's much easier to capture CO2 from a combined cycle uh, generator. But it's also, uh, the same remark can be made for cement plants and nitrogen production. Mm -hmm. The both, both produce some cleaner Mm -hmm. effluents, mm -hmm. much cleaner effluents than coal. Coal is the worst. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree, if you want to do, to take the low hanging fruits, go at these, and to do at these sources. Mm -hmm. And that's before maybe in 50 or 75 years time, where we will talk of technologies uh, uh, to change the climate of, uh, and, uh, and other climates, uh, other planets than ours, so we will be able to apply it to our own. 
So there's, that's the, I want to add that because I think it's, uh, we, uh, we can still be optimist for future generations. Okay, well, let, let me ask the panelist one question. Um, we are talking about coal, CCS, and, and these things, but, uh, and hydro also. Do you think in the power generation in certain time in the future, can we rely 100% on the renewables? Maybe, I think, uh, Friedbert, you say no because of coal, but <laughs> do you think there are some people who are saying, promoting the renewables as such, we will go to the future electricity can be 100% renewables. Do you think this is feasible? Okay, Olivia. Uh, I would say it's already made in some countries. Mm. I would say it's made in uh, Norway, for example because it's made also in Iceland because of geothermal energy and also with hydro. But it depends from one country to another country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say that in France, for example, it's completely crazy mm -hmm. because anyway, the problem of renewable is intermittence. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are solutions to store for a few hours electricity as in fact, uh, Patrick Pionet said very clearly that electricity is very difficult to store. It's possible to store for a few hours, but unfortunately what we need in order to develop 100% renewable is a seasonal, interseasonal storage. Mm -hmm. And for the time being, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. oh, it's, technically, it's possible, but totally infeasible because there is no business case uh, uh, for that. Okay. Yeah. But it's very attractive for the politicians, yeah. I would say. I, yeah, that's right. Politically, very correct statement. Read back. Well, first of all, I hope I have not brought myself in a position that I'm in favor of coal. I have just described the resistance. Okay. First, second, there can no, be no doubt that we will phase out coal in Germany, mm -hmm. but it will take much longer mm -hmm. than, for instance, the Green Party wants it. But the, mm -hmm. but the, the tendency to get away from coal is also okay. very clear in my country, just mm -hmm. that you do not have mis uh, any misunderstandings afterwards. If I believe that we can completely rely on, on uh, renewable energy sources, uh, I, I, w I would say at one stage perhaps, but uh, in the foreseeable future, that is difficult, and it is uh, much too costly. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Let me give you one example. Uh, in my country, the heating sector is, is very important uh, because it's getting cold in the winter, and, uh, uh, well, most people have gas uh, mm -hmm. heating systems, some oil, uh, and, uh, uh, well, we, we have a, a need of 300,000 megawatt, uh, which we need uh, uh, for the heat demand in Germany. Uh, our power grid is, de is designed for a quarter of that. So in the moment, we would say we electrify uh, mm -hmm. the whole system, uh, bring everything from, from uh, the renewable sector into electricity, always have pumps, uh, and get rid of gas and oil uh, completely in the heating sector, this is enormous costs mm -hmm. for the pumps, for uh, the new system, while the gas infrastructure is fully in place. So at a certain moment, we will come in very difficult waters with our populations, because they will say, well, we want climate change, but to what price? And are we allocating the money correctly? Another example, uh, if we continue our system in Germany, we will have paid until the year 2025 520 billion euro for subsidies. I think hardly any other country can afford that. Therefore, uh, we cannot be a model anyway. But uh, 520 billion euros is a wrong allocation of money. We would have been better to modernize old gas power plants. We would have been better not to look completely to electric cars, but perhaps low-hanging fruits, 
uh, why not have more gas uh, uh, transportation, especially in the in the heavy truck sector uh, or in the shipping uh, in the shipping uh, industry? So my idea is, or my my belief and my message to you is, we should put more emphasis on gas at least for the next 30 years or 40 years uh, and uh, uh, get the low-hanging fruits uh, of, of uh, climate change policies or climate protection policies and not always talk about these wonderful visions of 100 percent well perhaps we, we will achieve it at the end of the century but we have to make politics for the foreseeable future that's our task Ladislas. Just to complement on what you say, it's interesting to notice that gas-fired power plants have a stop to time, which is very reduced, and so it can quite well fit with intermittency mm -hmm. of renewable. Yeah. So the conjunction of renewable and gas power plants mm -hmm. actually works quite quite well. So that's w one additional comment I, I wanted to uh, mm -hmm. to make on the renewable, on paper, why not some da sometime? But we need to think completely again the, uh, the infrastructure model. Because at the end, when we think about it, uh, we have new renewable, which has a marginal cost of zero. Mm -hmm. When the whole system of electricity price mm -hmm. is based on the marginal cost. Mm -hmm. And so when you add up mm -hmm a marginal cost of zero, mm -hmm. then you question the whole model. The whole system is being questioned and saying, who is going to pay for the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. And when you have decentralized generation rather than centralized generation, mm -hmm. now you're going to store on the, on, the, on the infrastructure, who is going to pay for it? And so it's, it's, it's not just, oh, renewable makes electricity, that's fine. That we need to think it over completely and say and restructure. And that's where regulations are extremely important, in my view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I spend, I Go spend, ahead. I've spent nearly half of my career trying to explain to politicians the difference between capacity and availability. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't think right. I succeed. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, Andre, now, now the battery is cost is declining drastically, right? So do you think at some moment, combined yeah. with renewables, with battery yeah. may create a, some difference? Thank you. Yes, thank you for giving me the, oppor the, the, uh, <laughs> the opportunity. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a solar plant mm. 60 kilometers north of here. Okay. It's in a lab, of course. Okay? It's a sonar, solar energy park. Okay? And it's, it's run by uh, uh, Mohammed VI University. They claim with this, it's a solar thermal plant. It's not it's the thermal. photovoltaic yes. Okay. Yes. technology. Concentrated solar. solar. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Concentrated solar. They claim they can uh, uh, furnish 94% uh, availability mm -hmm. solar system. Mm -hmm. This, I didn't know since last week that this could exist. So research will make them better. But still, you're missing that 40%, 4%. And, you know, of course, but if it, I need to remember it every time, especially at night when we flip the switch, we expect the light to go on. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the 4% exception will not be an explanation, uh, not an acceptable one, at least. Mm -hmm. So that there needs to be a way to store energy. It's not developed yet. Or mm -hmm. What's developed yet is very, very expensive, yeah. therefore not affordable, mm -hmm. and has to stay in the lab uh, until it is affordable. Otherwise, right. we're, we're just uh, playing around, and this, these things will be criticized in the future. Okay. I think it will come. Yeah, yeah. To answer your question, it will come. Sure. It will take time. Yeah. But uh, the 100% mark should not be something we have in, it, in our minds now. Mm. I think what's been said last night, if we can go from 3% now, OK, 
okay, or 8% if you include hydro, yeah. okay, and uh, increase this to 30% and bring coal down in yeah. a, a, to 3%, that would be great. It should, we should be trying to do just that. Then we, if we want to do that rapidly, we have to go to the low hanging fruits. Okay. If yes. we don't do that, and we, if we stick with the present, uh, the, pre, the the present communication, saying that renewables will take all the place, well, we aim to waiting for a long time before before this problem is solved. Asuda-san, just follow. On. Is it possible to to support us? within Europe of 100%. It is possible if we can employ disruptive technology. For example, photovoltaic system mechanism is a very old technology. It was developed 60 years ago. Now it's flourishing, but it's old fashioned already. Intermittence could be overcome if we 100% utilize the energy from solar, sun. There is a way to produce, consistently produce electricity from solar energy, not just sunlight, but something else. And some people are working on that, including MIT. That's point number one. Point number two, as for the storage of uh, electricity, is very expensive, of course. Battery is very expensive still. But there is a technology called uh, wind thermal wind uh, powered thermal energy system that is to to use to use wind turbine but generate heat rather than electricity and heat is stored in molten salt system which will last 100 years without maintenance then use that energy to as base load so already Mm -hmm. Intermittent wind power could be used as base load. Mm -hmm. And those are technologies already on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So we should give more, more uh, pro you know, uh, publicity to those disruptive technology. And maybe, as you pointed out, support those new technologies together with several governments and companies. This is one of the, the possible way towards 100% renewables. And big point is, should we include re nuclear mm -hmm. in this 100%? Yeah. So if nuclear is added, I don't think it's, it's a long, long term mm -hmm. target. Yeah. Could be reachable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, nuclear, we will discuss a bit later. But uh, do you have a question? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Saeed Mourir from Morocco. I'm the head of the uh, Energy Efficiency Agency. Mm -hmm. You heard about energy demand and how energy efficiency can play a role sure. also to decrease emissions. Mm -hmm. It's very important sure. to look at on the demand. Mm -hmm. Second point, you mentioned the, the Bengeri project, but in Wazazat, 100 kilometers from here, we have a big solar plant mm -hmm. with energy storage, heat storage, mm -hmm. reaching a price of 11 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. 11 cents per kilowatt hour cents. today. Okay. Second point, we had a program for wind. In this country, we reached three, three cents per kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. developed by private companies, mm -hmm. financed by private companies. For 850 megawatt, we're reaching three cents per kilowatt hour today. Yeah. In the solar plant, we have the approach, of course, with solar thermal with storage that can stop the intermittency, mm -hmm. but with solar PV, we are reaching four cents per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. Here, the last tender show four cents per kilowatt hour. Hmm. So that's why I believe that this approach with renewables today, at the price that we're reaching mm -hmm. in a country like Morocco, a very energy dependent country, mm -hmm. we have coal, coal power plants. Mm -hmm. It's almost 50% of our electricity production today. It's one thing. Morocco is emitting 10 times less emissions than a European, mm -hmm. but we are doing we are having strong proactive policy for renewables mm -hmm. and for energy efficiency. Yeah. Because the, it's a mixture. We are living in transition. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day we can reach 100% of renewables. Mm -hmm. I, can, I think we can reach that because storage is not only, only linked to um, batteries, even that batteries are becoming cheaper and cheaper because of electric cars. Yeah. But also, 
we are reaching in storage, we are storing in dams. All the wind program that we have in Morocco is also linked to dams where you can pump water during the, when you have, it's mm -hmm. too windy, mm -hmm. and we can just to store electricity by mm -hmm. pumping water mm -hmm. and using it when we need. So many ways of storage today. So that's why our program of reaching 52% of our capacity from renewables in 2030, mm -hmm. it's the strategy at mm -hmm. the highest level of the state, strong proactive commitment. The King's letter was very clear. Since 2009, priority to renewable energy and energy efficiency hmm. is cheaper. What we are reaching today, what we believe that how renewables can play a role, and we were amazed by the price that we reached, three cents and six. So my question was also linked to why, how we can push also on energy efficiency in industry, transport, housing. Mm -hmm. uh, we are helping farmers in the country to switch from diesel pump to solar pumps. All the small applications of renewables are becoming much more cheaper. Yeah. It took for a farmer in Morocco 10 years to have payback before. Mm -hmm. Now it's only four years for two reasons. Because of the PV price decreased, because we stopped subsidizing fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. We're talking about carbon tax. How can you have carbon tax when many countries are at the same time still subsidizing fossil fuel? It's nonsense. Hmm. To be current, you need to have both. You need to stop subsidizing and you need this carbon tax to accelerate the approach. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, uh, let's say, uh, input to the discussion. And uh, you say the 52% on renewables at um, each year target? The 2030. 2030, okay. The 2030, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the, the Morocco, is there any uh, comments? Uh, okay, please, go ahead. A few additional comments. My name yep. is Louis Schweitzer, and I'm French, and I for a long time headed a car company called Renault-Nissan, mm. and I now work in promoting investment in new technologies for the mm. French government. Mm -hmm. a, a few comments first. Uh, one, everybody is in favor of a carbon tax, and uh, I support the carbon tax too, but it means you have to be able to put it at the borders of Europe. Mm -hmm because otherwise we will have a competitive problem which yeah. will be mm -hmm. difficult to explain mm -hmm. and to solve. Mm -hmm. And up to now, I have not heard from anybody readiness to impose such a tax on European borders. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the WTO would look positively upon it. So to me, this is an important issue which should be addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, second comment. Uh, I think the opposition between uh, uh, the ambitious goals in renewables and low-hanging fruit is, is not something which is important. I think you should pursue both because uh, if you look at renewables, uh, we are still on a learning curve cost-wise and technically. And the example just given uh, from Morocco shows that this is happening very fast. Mm -hmm. And if you do not give ambitious targets before you have acceptable costs, then you will never reach acceptable costs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to prime the pump at one time. Mm -hmm. Germany is doing it, maybe in a, some surprising ways, but mm -hmm. still, uh, it helps. And I truly believe that even in Europe, you will, will achieve for electricity uh, acceptable competitive costs from fully renewable. And let's take an example uh, on roads. Uh, I do believe that the electric car does have a future. Mm -hmm. And this future has started by regulations. China is an example, mm -hmm. a number of cities mm -hmm. is an example, but I believe will be competitive 10 or 15 years from now. Mm -hmm. So there again, you have priming with regulations and then the economy setting in. Sure. Uh, a second example is trucks. Uh, trucks, I believe electricity is not an acceptable solution looking forward. Gas instead of diesel fuel mm -hmm. is a very convincing yeah. mm -hmm. and I would say almost competitive. So this is a low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. So if you look at road traffic, you, you combine mm -hmm. low-hanging, immediately attainable, yeah. and more long-term, more ambitious programs. 
I agree. I mean, the gas, uh, the trucks can use the LNG in, 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 as a very good option, not compressed national gas, but also fuel cell, maybe, because of, it depends on the station, it's possible infrastructure issues there. There, but, I would need to be convinced as a former truck manufacturer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. LNG is, is as, a, as a very likely solution. By the way, uh, yes. You, you Thank just, you so much, uh, Mr. Tanaka-san. I'm uh, Marc-Antoine Einmaziger from the um, Center of Energy at IFRI in Paris. Okay. Um, I am very struck by the um, global, uh, um, at least around this side of the, of the table, the kind of uh, agreement that gas is definitely a role to play. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask uh, you whether you think this is natural gas or whether you have the impression that it could increasingly also be hydrogen, green gas, Mm -hmm. and, and where and under what conditions and maybe if we need yeah. more subsidies there. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm, uh, I'm trying to ask. <laughs> the golden age of gas is definitely coming and uh, what is uh, gas, uh, let's say, supply situation, what the pricing would be, what is the clean gas like hydrogen. Yeah, that is a question to, to the panelists. But is there anybody who is wants to take? Question? Oh, okay, please go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Hermine Durand from the French Nuclear Safety Authority. Mm -hmm. And as a compliment, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you think that really that replacing coal by gas is going to help us significantly to mitigate global warming and mm -hmm. respect the target of two degrees? Because it's, it's a good start mm -hmm. point, but then two degrees, it's really a small um, temperature increase. So is really gas the ultimate solution? Yeah, and, yeah. and you mentioned that CCS has like limited capacities, mm -hmm. so gas plus CCS is perhaps not the only key. Well, yeah, for you. IEA's uh, wedge analysis tells that the replacement of coal by gas certainly plays a certain role, but eventually to achieve two degrees, CCS must be applied to the gas also. So, I mean, the shift fuel shift from coal to gas is certainly play a certain role. Yes, uh, please. I want to throw in one more question uh, regarding uh, in relation to that uh, your question. Um, our institute uh, has been estimating the outlook up to uh, 2040, and this year for the first time we did it for 2050. And then the, uh, um, we have been doing that for the last 10 years or so, uh, to know, to be aware that the uh, dependence on the fossil fuels is uh, still uh, more than uh, 70 percent and then mm -hmm. almost 80 percent both in the reference case and then also in the alternative case, uh, like in uh, IEA, mm -hmm. uh, World Energy Outlook. Uh, then and we ask this question. Uh, we also run the longer term uh, the uh, integrated model for the climate change to realize that the, it is almost impossible to reach the two degree target by the end of the century if we if we assume the, the 2050 kind of uh, estimation and then the question is the how do we reach there where we replace everything with renewables or how we transit out of coal to gas uh, uh, looking at the situation in the market where the gas price is so low mm -hmm. and then the investment is not enough mm -hmm. and then we foresee mm -hmm. that the, uh, the supply and then demand balance yeah. will be met by 2020. Right. right. Go ahead. Read back. Uh, first, I would like to, to comment on, on uh, Mr. Schweitzer's, um, well, uh, sort of criticism uh, that we too much uh, try to, to put uh, uh, low-hanging fruits uh, in a position against uh, ambitious long-term aims. Uh, I happen to agree that you're completely right. We need both. We need uh, uh, aims, uh, far-reaching aims, even visions, and we need the ability to see in the foreseeable future what we can realistically do. What I criticized at the beginning is that politicians, at least in my country, but my feeling is also in others, uh, have the tendency uh, to be weak on the low-hanging fruits and to be uh, even more ambitious 
uh, with long-term aims, because for them, they are, can never be held responsible. And I uh, ask for more, for less ideologic uh, approach and more pragmatic approach, which looks to the next five to 10 years. Uh, all those, excuse me, all those predictions, what will be in 2050, if we look, that is, is, is now uh, 23 years, uh, let us go back 23 years and see what happened in these 23 years with oil prices, with tight oil, with shale gas. Um, all the predictions have been uh, completely wrong that we had in, in former times. So let us not look too far away and concentrate more on, on what we do. But again, of course, it is... Uh, uh, always good to have a vision of, of, the, of, the, of the future. When it comes to gas, I'm not only talking about natural gas, very important mm -hmm. point. Uh, I believe that more and more we will have green gas, biogas, synthetic gas, uh, uh, and that can be added. It will make gas greener, more legitimate, uh, and uh, we can make by this use, again, perhaps a little bit uh, European or German uh, perspective, we can make use of a very mature gas infrastructure and not getting rid of that and, and looking for a new infrastructure. So I think that is a very important point that you just made. Thank you. Uh, is Germany in favor of doing the hydrogen? I mean, Japan is pushing very hard on the hydrogen economy as such because uh, if we import LNG from the United States, the cost of gas in Japan is at least double. Right? So this gap never be diminishing because the transportation, liquefaction, etc. So to add the value to the fuel to import, just import hydrogen make good sense. But the pricing of the carbon, etc., is definitely necessary. Hydrogen. I, I doubt that this plays a big. I doubt that this plays a big role in our mm -hmm. uh, discussions today. Uh, what what plays an enormous role throughout Europe is LNG. Uh, okay. And that is, uh, uh, I mean, Europe has today 30 LNG terminals. Mm -hmm. uh, when we had the Russian-Ukrainian gas crisis in 2006 and 2009, we all said, well, now we have to diversify. And, and uh, in a very few years, we built these 30 uh, LNG terminals mm -hmm. with a capacity of 231 BCM of gas, huge. So uh, Europe has this pipeline gas from from Russia and from uh, mm -hmm. Norway, but we have more and more also the alternative uh, of LNG, and that makes us much more liquid uh, in the in the in the gas market. The gas market will be much much more getting away from oil index pricing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, much more to spot market. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we have a lot of possibilities to tell the Russians, well, if you put too high prices, we turn to LNG from the US or from Qatar and vice versa. So uh, what concerns the, the gas uh, production in Europe, it's declining dramatically, mm -hmm. as you might know. Yes. But uh, our sources yeah. of getting mm -hmm. pretty cheap imported gas mm -hmm. Uh, is is uh, pretty good and therefore in the combination with biogas and uh, synthetic gas I think it has a okay. has a good future Olivier. Olivier. Just, uh, switch off. Uh, on hydrogen I'm not a believer I think many people there are uh, uh, for uh, decades, uh, there were people uh, advocating for hydrogen, and I've never been convinced. Uh, I don't see uh, any technological breakthrough in hydrogen production or consumption, and uh, the uh, and I don't I see many uh, economic, technology, and safety mm. issues on uh, hydrogen development. I know that there is a strong lobby from uh, some uh, companies or uh, such as the gas producers, uh, Air Liquide in France. Yeah. But frankly, I don't believe that it will have a significant part in the energy mix for the next decades or centuries. Okay. 
the question is different for biogas, and I would like to highlight the problem of feedstock. I've been deeply involved in biofuels for in, uh, ethanol or biodiesel, and I'm afraid that for biogas, there will be the same problem. Hmm. What is the feedstock available? And clearly, it's not, it has not to be in competition with food. Hmm. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that uh, the quantity which may be available is not so important. In Germany, for example, 50% of, uh, the, uh, of the biogas is made from corn or anyway, for, uh, from, um, yeah, yeah, we know, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, we have to take that into account. I think, I'm afraid that the uh, quantity, the, it will increase, but uh, the quantity is not so high, and also you have to take into account the issue of logistics, which has a, a cost. Okay. Andre. Yeah. I think that the uh, best approach here is to, uh, number one, there has to be a, a CO2 pricing system uh, that will produce uh, resources. For me, I think it very, could very well be a taxation period, mm -hmm. but I know that this will be very difficult in the new US. I don't know that polit any political party, even the Democrats, could get elected on such a platform. Mm -hmm. So I have to say it has to be a, uh, whatever the system, but it has to be, you know, uh, priced. CO2 emissions have to be priced. Mm -hmm. Money, money has to be used uh, mainly to uh, develop the renewables. I mean, to develop the absolutely necessary uh, uh, technologies to make them firm supply as soon as possible. Uh, this, this is needs sound research and development uh, 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 management, of course. In the meantime, I agree with my, most of my colleagues here, natural gas should be uh, used to replace coal mm -hmm. and to produce other gases that uh, uh, can also be used to replace coal. Uh, Andre, yeah. the ambassador has asked us the question, of, for example, because of the very low price of gas now, yeah. do, do we have enough investment for the upstream of the gas sector to guarantee the big demand increase? I think there is. If I think there is because of shale gas. Essentially because of shale gas, it's, we talk about shale gas essentially when we talk about the U.S. reserves, but mm -hmm. the world is not limited to the U.S. reserves. There are, there are shale uh, in many, many countries of this world. And technology, what happened in the last that, 10 years is that technology to produce shale gas has gone down mm -hmm. greatly. Mm -hmm. making the price of, gas, of natural gas in the U.S., what, as I said before, the price it was when I was in the business of buying natural gas at $2 an MCF, okay? That's 20 years ago. Now, I think natural gas should be, can be used now in many countries to, uh, uh, to replace a coal power uh, generation plan. Now, but, but, I don't think it to, we have to make sure that this does not have an impact in postponing the renewables mm -hmm. in any way. Right. Because in some countries, maybe shale gas is not available, and, and we will need anyway uh, the uh, renewables because, to my point of view, the largest source of energy on this earth remains the sun and, therefore, the uh, solar. Solar is the largest source. When it comes to, is it available or not, or not, it's solar. On the long term, all of these, they, they, as we all know, the uh, natural gas or oil or coal, uh, we will use, but will disappear as we use them. So, okay. in one way or the other, we will end up with solar. 
Let, let's give you some, let's, let me ask the panelists a question, which I was asked about two years ago when I participated in the Saudi Aramco's board meeting with Daniel Yagin. The, Al -Fali, the, the, the current energy minister was there, and he asked us as a panelist to the board, the question is when the peak demand of oil comes. I was really surprised. It's Saudi Aramco, right? And they, they are very concerned about Tesla, China's electric vehicle, Japanese Mirai, etc. So, so it's, a, it's mainly the electric vehicle replacing the gasoline engine cars. So the answer was, I didn't, uh, but just, I, it was two years ago, and uh, I was very serious. They were talking about uh, the possible, what's a change of their policy, rather ex not exporting crude oil, but only hydrogen to give the value to the clean fuel as such. So just, we had discussed about technologies, but what do you think? It, do you think this peak demand of oil is coming? When? Okay, Ladislav. May I, may, uh, because I think that just to, to follow up on the question of uh, Louis Schweizer, I find very interesting, carbon leakage still is, is a very important issue because we talked about carbon pricing, but oh. if we don't uh, manage to find a way on avoiding that there would be leakages, as uh, was mm -hmm. rightly mentioned, and it's, it's a very thorny and difficult issue to solve. I think the, the only way at that stage really to try to do something pragmatic is to have a low carbon price, mm -hmm. because it will make the leakage more difficult because there are costs associated with mm -hmm. uh, carbon leakage. Mm -hmm. And uh, to answer the, the, the question, or to complement the answer to the question, uh, uh, regarding to the real benefit of uh, switching uh, from uh, coal to gas, I just want to remind that, uh, of course, everybody knows it, but it's worth mentioning it, that uh, for power generation, gas emits half as much as coal. And if you were to, uh, to transfer to all the, for power generation, coal to gas, that would represent something like five gigatons of CO2. So it's about 10% of what is emitted worldwide today. So that's not just not enough. And, and saying it, it would not be enough, I think, uh, is not satisfactory to say, okay, uh, let's do it. Then uh, we'll see uh, if, uh, or let's start doing it, even though I agree that all coal will not be substituted. W maybe I can uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, give my... Uh, uh, I asked a question to your boss on uh, on the uh, <laughs> on the on the peak demand, and we focus. Uh, many discussions are being focused on EVs, mm -hmm. but I think first we have to keep in mind that today uh, the use of oil for light duty vehicles, because uh, heavy trucks is different, it's electric vehicles do not really adapt very well to heavy trucks uh, for, uh, because of the weight, because of the distances, etc. But the light duty vehicle segment of oil demand is about 25% of mm -hmm. oil demand. So first, even though there would be a big switch to electric vehicle, mm -hmm. what I think, by the way, is going to take place sometime down the road, that's uh, for sure. But there are two elements that limit the impact. The first one is mm -hmm. what I just mentioned, that it's only, well, only between brackets, 25% of demand. And second, that there is another element which looks, looks absolutely critical in my view, which is the, the, the efficiency of the IC engines, mm -hmm. which is going actually to, to be mm -hmm. the, the main driver for displacing oil demand rather mm -hmm. than electric okay. vehicles. It's and efficient. if they displace actually cars which will be more and more efficient, mm -hmm. the amount of volumes that will be displaced mm -hmm. because of that will be reduced at, at the end. And, and so even though that would be very important, we see uh, relatively maybe, I don't know, a 10% of oil demand being displaced by electric vehicles in the, in the future. So, so you don't think the peak demand of oil is not coming so soon? Okay, that is what IEA is saying, but uh, general, I, I, well, Olivia. 
Uh, I think uh, uh, we need, I would like to uh, remind you some facts and figures. Transport sector represents 60% of oil consumption, and the bulk of the increase of demand is coming from transport sector. Uh, uh, petroleum products represent 95% of the energy consumption of the transport sector. What about the 8%? Uh, 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 it's 5% natural gas already. Natural gas represents 5% of the consumption of the transport sector, 3% biofuel, and electricity only 1%. And it's not personal car. Mm -hmm. It's mostly uh, the rail. Uh, so, uh, we have to, uh, it's necessary to get these facts uh, uh, in mind when we discuss about electric vehicle and the potential of growth. Energy efficiency is a clear target. It's the first, uh, uh, the first uh, dramatic game changer in the transport sector. With now we may uh, put on the market cars consuming only two liters per 100 kilometers. Mm -hmm. And the hybrid technology merging both electricity and IC engine, mm -hmm. uh, hybrid technology is very, very efficient. Second, the alternative of, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to petroleum products and natural gas clearly is an alternative mostly for, uh, for the heavy trucks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also, don't forget uh, uh, the maritime, uh, maritime transport. Mm -hmm. Biofuel, biofuel also is very important. And so, uh, electricity, uh, it will increase. But I'm afraid that in the next 20 years, it will represent only a small part mm -hmm. of the displacement of uh, oil to, uh, in the transport sector. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. That's, that's I, I recall a very interesting comment by uh, the late Christo de Maggiore. It was somewhere around 2009 or 10 in the International Oil Summit in Paris. He said, I, I feel somehow oil consumption will not e e exceed 100 million barrels. <laughs> yeah, well, that is, he's always saying that. Yes, he said I remember, that. yes. He and now it's, it's, it's exceeding <laughs> nearly 100 million barrels per day. But what he felt that time still lingers in my mind. Mm -hmm. What element he had in his mind. Mm. And That's interesting. we shouldn't underestimate the gut feeling of legendary de Majori, uh <laughs> today. <laughs> and also 1.5 transport. Mm. 100 million cars will displace only 1.2 million Burst per day of oil. It's 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 marginal, but if 100 million cars will explode due to solid state battery, now under the road by Toyota and uh, Dyson and others, and if mileage of EVs will increase rapidly, and if more car sharing will spread. Just, not just in OECD member countries, but others, the number of cars will stop to increase as it, it, it used to do. If you take all these elements, all in all, I think oil demand could peak somewhere around 2030. Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. 30. 2030. 2030. 30, okay. That's my feeling as of today. Thank you. Yeah, okay. do you have any bills? Uh, I, I talk to the, the Chinese guys and they are sometimes, uh, you know, uh, CNPC Research Institute guy told me that, uh, you know, the, the replacement gas may happen, so peak demand of oil may even happen 2025. If it happens in China as such, why not? Yeah. So there's a definitely the risk of peak demand is coming earlier. So that is the reason why Saudi Aramco is preparing for that and selling part of their shares if they can. Go ahead. Make you laugh a little bit. I don't make any prediction on the price of oil or on peak oil. Because every time I did, I was wrong. Yeah, that is exactly that is exactly what I, I, I have been saying when I was the head of the IEA. I never predict the oil price because I know I'm wrong. By the way, uh, 
do can we move a little bit? We, we ha still have about 30 minutes to go. Can we talk about the future of the nuclear power? Do we agree on some? I mean, we may agree or not, but do you think that there is a future of the nuclear power even after the Fukushima accident? Japan's situation is that uh, if we take a poll of the public now, more than majority is against restarting current nuclear power plant. Korea's president is saying the phasing out the nuclear power. Germany decides to phase out by 2022. France is moving from 70% to 50%. Um, and uh, the, in the United States, thanks to the very cheap gas price, the nuclear power do not have any competitiveness. So, so there are lots of closing of the current reactors happening. Some states are concerned about it, like uh, New York uh, or Illinois. They give certain support measures, like renewables, to nuclear to maintain it. So without uh, that kind of support, nuclear is not uh, competitive. But China, India, Russia are building nuclear power. That's without question. They need these big uh, power source for their economy. So I think OECD countries will have definitely difficulty of building the big light water reactor system in the future. Do we accept or do we have some alternatives to move ahead? Is the nuclear program is not the safety only, but uh, spent fuels or high level wastes or proliferation risk of weaponization? North Korea now have a weapon. If Iran agreement is aborted by Mr. Trump, Iran will go back to the nuclear weapon very quickly, right? And then that triggers the weaponization of Saudi Arabia, probably. So this kind of nuclear is not, it's not simply the power, electric power issue. It is a very serious national security issue. And uh, how can we manage this nuclear uh, energy in the future. This is my question. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, thank you. I don't think there is any source, including the renewables, that uh, do not have opposition anywhere in the world. Wind parks, people don't like if they are in their, <laughs> in their courtroom and, and so on. So, I would not certainly recommend to introduce nuclear in a country where there are none today, because that's not the opposition. It's going to be a big, big mm -hmm. opposition. Mm -hmm. But in countries where it is, people have get to live with it. Of course, Japan may be an exception. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would certainly, uh, I, I think, the nuclear industry is pessimistic in this country mm -hmm. as, as for its future, and uh, this doesn't help at all what uh, uh, the, we, uh, the, the international community, is trying to do relative to global warming, because nuclear is one of the sources that does not produce or produce very much less than a, any other source, CO2. So. That I think in nuclear, in in region like in uh, countries like France, I can I think they, they sh it should be maintained and maybe developed at this right time. Let us remember that renewables in Germany are backed up with nuclear in France. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's yeah. reality because one is firm, the other one is not. Okay, yes, and I, uh, I think it's a, a very big negative what uh, uh, we understand, what we hear about the nuclear these days because they have to go on bed because security reasons, they'll all close down. I don't think it's a, a positive news for the fight against climate change. Okay. Lee, Lee San, do you think the Korea will continue nuclear or phase out? 
Mr. Mr. very sensitive Mr. matter in Korea nowadays. Yes. And uh, since I have a little differing views from the current government uh, policy on nuclear, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say that we need further discussions on the pros and cons of mm -hmm. nuclear power plant. You see, the current uh, administration, which took effect uh, in uh, May, decided to halt uh, construction of new coal power generators and also halt the, the nuclear power uh, generators, uh, genera uh, generators under construction. Mm -hmm. But there has been a very intensive discussions among the juries consisting of ordinary people assisted by experts decide that we may go ahead with the uh, nuclear power plant on the construction, but we will not construct any new nuclear power plant in the future. Mm -hmm. But since there are very strong opposition from the expert on energy in Korea, I'm not so sure that policy may sustain over the next five years, mm -hmm. which is the term of our president. I Thank see. you. Thank you. Masuda-san. I, I suspect uh, uh, the current situation today tell us nuclear will not go along well with Western democracy. Everywhere democracy, nuclear faced problems. Not Japan is not exception. And we, under such many companies in the West are, are losing expertise and passion, even passion to pursue nuclear options. And Toshiba is now on the on the brink of bankruptcy, and Areba is, uh, is sold by ETF and all those. And I don't see any any enthusiasm coming from those companies. Number one, because they don't have any investment at home or in the western part of the world, and the rest of the world is now dominated by Russian Ross Atom together with government low interest rate. And China is busy at home, but Chinese companies will go abroad. So in the Western democracy environment, will not accommodate uh, more nuclear power plants, except in France, hopefully. And about SML, small modular reactors, this is a light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, because because of small scale and low efficiency, the SML will not be commercially viable unless they are ordered in the order of hundreds. Mm. And this is, again, is not realistic. So my conclusion in the West or under pure democratic countries, I don't see a big future about nuclear. But the rest of the world, pushed by Russia, followed by China and India, nuclear has a longer future. Thank you. Please, uh, to be provocative, to, I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Tatsuo, but to be provocative, don't you consider that UK is not a democracy? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, 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 I'm, uh, uh, I, somehow I agree with your comments. Uh, what is important is that well, the most important country in the world, as far as nuclear is concerned, is the United States. Right. And the United States policy on nuclear is totally unclear. That's true. And that's a very important problem. And uh, it's still on mm -hmm. uh, uh, President Trump does not know what to do. And uh, I, I don't. Uh, anyway, uh, as it has been clear, explained by Patrick Pouyanné yesterday, uh, the main uh, challenges are related to uh, public acceptance, that's mm -hmm. clear, but also to cost, and it's quite new compared to the situation uh, the, a few decades ago. Uh, increase of cost due to safety measures linked to post-Fukushima, mm -hmm. and which increased significantly the cost, right. and also the fact that there is no real serious effect. You know that the price 
of PV decrease. The cost of PV uh, decreased dramatically because of the series effect. Mm -hmm. And it's not uh, the same in a new club because mm -hmm. there are only a few, uh, a few units which will be uh, mm -hmm. built. So uh, I agree with you, uh, Tatsu, also mm -hmm. the Western industry, the nuclear industry, is not in a real, uh, good, really in a good shape. Uh, but still, uh, there are uh, significant uh, projects, uh, both in China and Russia, and maybe newcomers, uh, such as India, but anyway, due to the situation in India, it will take time. And uh, maybe also Saudi Arabia, they need to have a base load of production. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but thanks, we, we have the example of UK. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Well, my, my country, as you know, after Fukushima, decided very quickly uh, to phase out. And while there are a lot of discussions in Germany about oh, yes. what I said, uh, <coughs> in tariffs, uh, is the path right of, of energy vendor of energy transition, mm -hmm. the consensus that it was right to phase out nuclear is uh, absolutely uh, um, in place. Uh, it has not at all been shaken. Um, and I, I believe one of the main reasons for that is the fear of terrorism. Mm -hmm. so, so, of course, we do not have uh, mm -hmm. tsunamis and uh, earthquakes, but we have ISIS and uh, its uh, uh, enormous willingness to kill as much people as possible. And in a climate and in a situation where we have terrorism and will live with it for, for quite some time, most probably, we believe that uh, the whole, um, uh, it's, it's not only the nuclear power plant, it's the transport, it's the storage, gives so much uh, um, mm. possibilities to attack. Uh, I think that was one of the main reasons. And when it comes to nuclear in the world, I absolutely agree we will have nuclear for a long time because of certain interests. Uh, well, Rosatom is, is a clear mm -hmm. example. Also because nuclear won new legitimacy because of the CO2 discussions. So if you take the G7 agreement of Elma, or, or well, also G20, uh, the, the whole reduction aims are only realistic if we count in nuclear. So uh, the German Green Movement never mentioned that in Germany. They all said, well, uh, great success for us. That uh, the whole agreement of the international community means, well, we continue with nuclear. Uh, was was never really discussed in my country, but but I think it is a, a part of the truth. Yeah, some other European country called it German angust, but uh, <laughs> right. Um, I think that we were probably more afraid at certain moments after Fukushima than the Japanese. Than yeah, well, Japanese are very concerned about it, but also we are worrying about uh, possible accident in China. If something wrong happens, uh, you know, same impacts to us. So Japan can stop nuclear power, but does it help? The safety operation in China is a question, right? Yeah. So if that, so, so in that sense, you know, Japan need to continue the operation and uh, share the lessons with China mm -hmm. makes more sense. Otherwise, we will have much more serious problems. Of course, this, does this convince the public? This is totally different view. So uh, my argument is with the small modular fast reactor technology, this is a sustainable uh, nuclear in a way for the passive safety and take care of the waste, high level waste and proliferation resistance. So if we can define, identify these technologies, maybe we can have a chance, which by the way, this technology is Korean, uh, American, I mean, US Korea is, is working on this technology uh, for the new model of the future of the nuclear, but uh, we'll see. This is 
very tricky and very, very difficult. Um, we need a good discussion. Um, we have covered almost all the items of the energy and climate, uh, but uh, Olivia, you, you want yeah, to have four? Uh, I just want to come back to coal. We discussed uh, intensively on coal at the beginning, but I think that we missed one very important point for me, and I would like to remind you the basi some basics, facts and figures on coal. First, coal price is as a, a leading role in the price of power generation of electricity everywhere in the world. And second, coal, 50% 50, 50 of the consumption of coal is in China. And uh, so the problem is what about the uh, coal policy of China? Mm -hmm. we, we think that they are phasing out from coal. Mm -hmm. In fact, for local environment reasons, they are shutting down many power plants, very inefficient, and they, replace, they are replacing old power plants with an efficiency of 25% by brand new coal power plants, supercritical, uh, with an efficiency of 50%, and they are building one coal power plant of 500 megawatts every week. So, in fact, uh, uh, more than 50% of the uh, energy supply of uh, uh, China is coming from coal, which represents 90% of, uh, of the power generation. And clearly, uh, the price of coal is managed, in fact, by the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. uh, high price may jeopardize their economy, but too low price is jeopardizing their mining industry with millions of jobs. And uh, in fact, the question when we discuss about coal is uh, mandatory to discuss about the coal policy of China. And I'm afraid that for quite a long time, coal will play, continue to play a major role in the energy mix. And what about India? Uh, the uh, uh, energy consumption worldwide uh, will also come from India. In fact, India, they, are a they have a plan to increase their coal consumption from mm. 500 uh, uh, million tons to 1.5 billion tons of coal produced because it's produced locally and they have significant reserves. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it's very important to consider what will be the future mm -hmm. of coal in these two, those two countries. Mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. I don't care about Germany, about Poland. Uh, it's, I would say if we consider the climate change issue, <coughs> yeah. the most important is what's going on in China and India as far as coal is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also ASEAN countries is increasing mm -hmm. the coal very substantially. Indonesia uh, is that case. But, uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we have covered quite a lot. We have about uh, 15 minutes. If there's any questions from the floor uh, or comments from the floor, we most welcome. It's ex uh, we are exhausted all the <laughs> Uh, okay, yes. So, final comments from yeah. the panelists. Yeah. Starting I, I, on, I, I think uh, yes, I Andre. overlooked the, 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 possible, the possibility relative to demand management when it comes ah, to okay. energy storage okay. to support mm -hmm. renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, my uh, company, uh, we uh, pretend that we will reduce by 6% the demand. Mm. managing at a distance mm. uh, water eaters through digital technologies. Mm -hmm. This is this is significant. If you compare that six what's the cost of that six percent mm. if it's molten salt or any the pump pumping uh, mm -hmm. reserve or things like that. So uh, demand side management as uh, I think as a new role here. Yeah. to play True. because of digital technologies right, right, there's right. a lot more mm -hmm. potential to it mm. thank you much, very much for a very good now. point uh, Dr. you want the floor I'd like to close this wonderful debate with optimistic view mm. 
I sometimes have discussion with IE people, uh, including tanks and successors, and I discuss why don't you include this, this, this technology in your forecast or projections. The answer is very clear. We are not supposed to include technology which is not proven yet or proven through te test plant or pilot plants. But I have to say there are many, many technologies in pipeline very close to the pilot plant or test plants. And if we shed light on those, the future is more brighter and technology can play a bigger role and uh, decarbonization will take place sooner than uh, later. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Ladislas? Uh, as a corporate, I just want to, to, to remind that if there are a lot of threats associated with climate change, we do see huge, huge potential uh, opportunities. And in particular, in energy efficiency, in new businesses linked to CCS, as uh, we mentioned. So I think we, we, we should look also at the, at the positive part associated with the transition mm -hmm. that pops up many, many opportunities for the corporate world. Yeah. Oh, that is uh, your strategy. I remember that, uh, Renzaf, that you are, your, your division is called the Strategy and Climate. Right? This is a very inter <laughs> interesting naming of uh, Patrick Puyane's interest in climate in total, I guess. No, I think that's, that's that, thank you for mentioning that, because uh, <laughs> it's right that sometime, you know, the guy in charge of strategy, why would you put climate? Mm. For, with strategy, I mean, uh, and uh, yeah, that's a fair question. And I think actually it's, it's much deeper than what people can think that for an oil and gas company, for an energy company, I should say, that invests over 30 years, 40 years' time, it's very important to, to have embedded in the strategy, in the decision-making process mm. of the company, okay, what's the impact on climate? And so integrating climate issues into the strategy mm -hmm. is something that may appear to be unique, but we think, and that was uh, under uh, Patrick Puyane's uh, uh, really leadership, that he said, okay, we have to join them together. And I'm very honored to be in charge of this uh, function, but it, it's right that it's quite unique. Yeah, this is very interesting. Well, that's exactly the reason why Total has an internal carbon pricing, and uh, that, that kind of exercise is probably very important for the other major players in the field to do the same. And because by doing so, the financial sector will evaluate such companies, and the money goes into there. And those who are not doing are eliminated out for the better financing. That is probably a first step. Rather than building the carbon tax system or carbon trading system as such, if many companies start doing this kind of practices, then we are ready to have the institutional arrangement of carbon pricing in the future. But uh, feedback. Well, uh, I don't know if it has to do with the fact that I'm German, but I'm uh, more pessimistic than others. Uh, I see the, the potential that uh, with new technologies, with digitalization, with CCS and CCU, low-hanging fruits, everything we discussed, nevertheless, I believe we are, uh, we are not fast enough. Uh, we will not reach the, uh, not even the, the two-degree aim. Uh, so, my prediction is that we will only learn, most probably, and I deeply deplore that, if uh, the world continues to have worse and worse weather and more and more catastrophes. So we can only learn, obviously, it's the same with us as a person. We start to live healthy after the first heart attack. Uh, and uh, a little bit it is the same with the world. We can have all the uh, knowledge in the world that, that it comes, that it gets worse, but uh, only the climate catastrophes remind us that this is reality. And my fear is that we are running behind. Uh, so I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic. 
Okay, if we don't die by the first attack, it's okay, but, uh, well, Olivier. Four short comments. Uh, in the Kyoto Protocol, uh, at the same level, there were uh, the aspect of mitigation and adaptation. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, we don't consider seriously the adaptation issue. There is a small part in the, uh, in the Paris Agreement, but if we, could, uh, if we are not able to cope with uh, the two degrees, as you say, adaptation will become more and more important, mm -hmm. first point. Mm -hmm. Second point, you have to take into account the inertia of the energy system. Patrick Pouinet reminded us uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. the capital turnover in buildings is one person per annum. So anyway, we, uh, if we, we replace, it will take a long time if we change the old buildings in brand new buildings. The same applies for the power generation. The lifetime of any power plant is 50 years. So the inertia of the energy system is quite important. Third point, don't focus our discussion only on electricity. Electricity represents 20% of the problem. It's 20% of the energy, final energy consumption. But in mm -hmm. fact, it represents 95% of the political comments. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, energy efficiency is a, par a paramount. And it's, we would spend more time discussing about energy efficiency. Thank you very much. Um, energy efficiency is certainly very important. Uh, I remember that IA's publication called uh, uh, Gadgets and Gigawatts, because energy efficiency uh, certainly reduced the consumption of power. But uh, the new gadgets come in, in the digitization or electronics, uh, will have more demand for that. So it's compensating. So the total electricity demand is increasing, unfortunately, regardless of our great effort in energy efficiency. That was the history. But anyway, um, thank you very much for the good comments. Uh, do you want to floor? Yes, I just wanted okay. to add yes, please. that uh, you have a, a, a must have already concluded from my accent that I am a French Canadian. Mm -hmm. I have uh, <laughs> myself oh, I learned noticed. this afternoon that some of my ancestor must have been close to the German border, the German border, because too I am a little bit pessimistic about uh, a real possibility to limit the increase in temperature yeah. by two degree, mm -hmm. unless, unless we have become much more practical. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. I have to say on this issue, I think uh, I would like to stress the importance of Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. The Paris Agreement objective is to achieve adaptation and mitigation by making all countries, whether advanced or developing, participate. Mm -hmm. How we to achieve this objective is through technology, finance, and capacity building, especially for developing countries. Therefore, the decision of US administration to withdraw from the Paris Agreement does not make any uh, significant impact on this, but it will have a definitely mm -hmm. very yeah. negative impact on finance sector. Mm -hmm. So it is time for all of us to think how to address these issues in the years to come. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. For I appreciate all the comments and the inputs uh, yeah, from the panelists as well as Floor. Yeah, we have learned a lot about the Trump's impact to, to this COP agree, uh, agreement, and certainly Mr. Lee's comment is viable uh, for there's a certain impact. But at the same time, the private sector's investment, technology development, and uh, on renewables will continue. So for that, yes, the, 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 the impact itself may be less, but uh, 
of course, uh, the coal issue is uh, 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 is big, and uh, CCS is necessary for that. Carbon pricing is is an important way to promote, um, uh, and and uh, carbon pricing mechanism, internal carbon pricing mechanism in the corporation is probably the first step that we have to move on. Um, the, the change is very rapid so how can we uh, cope uh, you know to, to, to match these changing speed is certainly the issue for the private sector as well as government um, when I was in the IA I'm always saying that uh, the government policy in the energy sector or infrastructure must be stable and predictable otherwise, private sector will never ever invest for 40, 50 years of the uh, infrastructure. The on, off, on, off, it politically very often happens, like coal issue is a case, nuclear is a one, a renewable, same thing. So by changing the policy, if the government changes, that's sending a terrible message. So how can we make energy policy more stable? And predictable is what uh, I was always talking in, in the IA. But nonetheless, having a good dialogue like this helps to reduce the unpredictability. So we will continue. And I really thank you uh, for the uh, contributions. And I wish uh, all, everybody join me of thanking the panelists for the discussion. Yeah.